All right, what we're going to work on here is what we call a uh, one or a two-sample test for proportions. Again, this is a two-sample test for proportions. So we have a car manufacturer is trying to lower the amount of defects it has in its cars. Two distinct assembly procedures are used to build the cars. In a sample of 350 cars coming off the line using the first procedure, there were 28 with major defects. Well, in a sample of 500 cars coming off the second assembly line shows 32 cars with defects. Is the difference between the two assembly procedures significant? So the basic idea of what we're trying to do here is we want to determine if one of these procedures is better than the other. So we have to start off with testing on the assumption that they are exactly the same. And that's the key thing that we have to understand in this first problem here. So we start off with a null hypothesis. In the, you can look at it kind of two ways, that the proportion from procedure one is equal to the proportion for procedure two. Or another way of looking at it is that the difference of proportion one minus proportion two is equal to zero. Basically, either one of these shows the fact that there is no difference between the two assembly procedures. And that's, the, that's what we have to start off thinking. Now, the alternative hypothesis would be simply that there is a difference. We're not going to claim that one is better than the other. The problem gave no indication that one assembly procedure is better than the other. We're just going to say that there is no difference. Or again, another way of looking at it is that the difference proportion 1 minus proportion 2 does not equal 0. So this will make this a two-tail test. So the key idea we have to start off here is what we saw. And what we saw in the first sample was 28 out of 350 cars with defects. That's a proportion of 0.08 or 8%. And then again, from the second sample, the second proportion with the second assembly procedure, we saw 32 out of 500 defective cars, which is 0.064 or 6.4%. Now, here's the key idea. When we're running this test, we have to assume the whole time is that there's truly no difference, that both procedure one and procedure two are completely identical. So when we're doing this, and you only do this with tests, not with intervals, is you have to create what's called a p hat pooled, okay, or a total, a p hat total. Basically, if we're going to assume that both procedures are the same, why have two separate groups? Why have two separate samples? Let's put them all together. So we'd have the 28 defective cars plus the 32 defective cars for a total of 60 defective cars out of a total of 850 cars. Again, that's the 350 and the 500. That gives us a pooled proportion of 0 0.0706. Now, the reason why we're doing this is because we are on the assumption throughout this entire problem that there is no difference. So if there is no difference, we put them all together. They all go into the same pool. So now when we find standard error, the standard error of this difference is going to be um, the standard error of the pooled value. So we do not look at this as a standard error for each and then combine them like you would for a confidence interval. You look at it all together. So we got the giant square root here of 0 0.0706 times 0 0.9294. That would obviously be um, Q hat pooled divided by the 350 cars in the first sample, plus, again, the exact same value, 0 0.0706 times 0 0.9294, divided by uh, the 500 total cars. Now, again, in a confidence interval, this would be 0 0.08, 0 0.92, and the same thing for the second sample, 0 0.064, and so forth. But when you're working with a test, you're under the assumption the whole time that everything's the same. And just so you're aware, there is another formula that some books will use and look at this. And basically, since both of the numerators are the same, they factor that out. And they put the 0.076 times the 0.9294 in front. And then again, it's still all under a big square root. They have 1 over 350 plus 1 over 500. They basically just factor that out, so you may see that on your formula sheet. But regardless, the standard error here, when we combine all this together, and I'll put it over here and run out of room, is 0 0.0179. So that's the standard error we're going to have to be using. And again, why are we doing this pulled? Because we're assuming the whole time that they're both exactly identical.
So now we want to be able to apply this to a normal model. So we do need to check real quick our conditions. So let's go through the conditions real quick here. And um, remember when you're working with proportions, condition number one is that they both samples have to be simple random samples. Condition two is both samples have to be less than 10% of the population size. And again, 500 and 350, I'm assuming both are less than 10% um, of all cars. And the third condition is you do need 10 successes and 10 failures. So if you look at the first assembly procedure, they produce 28 defective cars, which would be my successes. And that would be 222 um, or I'm sorry, 322 failures. And you're working with the second procedure, there was 32 defective cars, which result in 468 failures. So we do have our more than 10 in both cases. And don't forget that fourth um, condition, that both groups do have to be independent of each other. So one assembly line cannot affect the other. And the problem did say that they were two distinct different assembly lines. So now that we kind of check the conditions, we can get into doing some of the actual work here. And the work we want to basically find is when you're working with proportions, you always are using z-scores. So the z-score we start off with is what's the difference that we saw? Well, remember, we saw, I'll come down here and do a little side work, we saw 8% for the first group, and we saw 0.064 for the second group. That is a difference of 0.016, a 1.6% difference. So 0.016 minus, what difference did we expect? Remember, the whole time we were under the assumption that there was no difference between these two groups. Divided by our standard error from the pooled value of 0.0179. And this gives us a z-score of 0.89. Three, nine. Now, we want to take a look and kind of understand what that means in terms of the normal model. So if we look at a normal model real quick, kind of a crappily drawn normal model, we have to understand that we can go up one, two, three, down one, two, three. Now remember, right smack dab in the zero, right smack dab in the middle is zero, and that's what we were expecting the whole time, no difference. And what we're seeing was 1.6% has a z-score of 0.89, so we're talking a z-score somewhere right around here. So the probability of more extreme than that would be all this up here, which is kind of likely. It's a lot of data up there. But remember, we just care about there being a difference or not. So we also got to look at the negative 0.89, which would be around here somewhere, because this is a two-tail test. So again, both tails have a lot of data on there, so we're probably going to find out here that seeing the difference we saw is very likely. So let's go back and actually find that value. So now we actually want to find the p-value. To find the p-value, we're going to do a normal CDF on our TI-83 or TI-84 calculator. And this is a positive value, so we're going to do 0.8939 towards 99. And we get a value on the upper end of 0.1857. But again, uh, or again, because this is a two-tailed test, we're going to multiply this by two because, again, we're just talking about there being a difference. So that could be a difference on the positive extreme or on the negative extreme. And that would give us a total final p-value of 0.3714. So that is our p-value right there. I'll write that next to that there. And that tells us that the probability of seeing the difference we saw of 1.6% or more extreme when we were supposed to see a difference of zero the whole time is 37.14%. So again, this is the probability, 37.14% is the probability of seeing the difference we saw or more extreme when we were assuming that there was no difference. So if you think about our alpha levels, again, we talk about alpha levels of 0 0.1, 10%, 0.05, 5%, 5%, 5%, or 0.01, 1%. Regardless of what alpha level we would choose, we would definitely fail to reject the null. So our conclusion would be to fail to reject the null. Basically, you know, it comes down to a simple idea. What we saw was extremely likely to occur. 
if the null was true that there is no difference. So when we're talking about samples, we're always going to see a difference between two samples, even if we're assuming zero, no difference. But you're going to see a difference when it comes to looking at samples. The idea was the difference we saw was very, very, very likely to occur. So when something is likely to occur, it means that, you know what, what we saw was nothing special, nothing rare. So we're going to fail to reject the null. These two procedures must have no difference. We basically do not have enough significant evidence to prove that there is a difference between procedure one and procedure two. So failing to reject the null as our conclusion basically tells us that there is no significant evidence. And my awesome handwriting here is going to show that to you. So basically, the answer to the question, was there a significant difference between the two groups? The answer is no, there was not. What we saw was very likely to occur at any one of our alpha levels, so we're going to fail to reject the null. There must still truly be no difference between these two um, procedures. So remember the four steps. Step one, don't forget, we need to make sure that we have our hypotheses, which were right here. Um, step two, which should be the conditions that we checked which were right here. We went through them real quick. And step three would be our work showing the standard error, the z-score, the p-value, and then of course step four would be your conclusion of failing to reject the null. There is no significant evidence between, of a difference between these two groups.